As you're seated this morning, let's take our Bibles and turn back to the book, the letter, if you will, 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. As we come to really a, a, one of the most salient passages of, of this, this letter of the Apostle Paul written to the Thessalono, uh, Thessalonians in concern for them and their well-being. And as we come, I think it's appropriate as we look and are encouraged this morning that it is at this time of December that we come upon this passage. As we talk about hope, and it is relevant because we call this the season of hope. Why? Because we celebrate the first advent of our Savior, who is our hope. I love the words as the Apostle Paul, as he encouraged young Timothy, the young pastor, and exhorting, exhorting him in his ministry. He said this in his opening words in chapter 1, verse 1. He says, Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus, according to the commandment of God, our Savior, and of Christ Jesus, who is our hope our hope we know so that as we celebrate this time of the year the apostle paul also reminded of the churches of galatia that it was at this time the fullness of time this dispensation god sent forth his son born of a woman born under the law so that we might or he might redeem those who were under the law that we might receive the adoption of sons. And we know that, that from the Gospels that the, the nation of Israel prior to the first advent lived in anticipation of the promise. We know so from Genesis chapter 1 when the promise was given. And throughout the Scriptures and through the prophets, they longed, Peter says in, in 1 Peter chapter 1, longed to see and to look into the things the prophets did of the things of Christ as well as the angels into the salvation that was that had come. Yet as we know and, and as they anticipated this promise, the promised Messiah and he did come that there were those who missed it and it was the religious that missed it. And there were those who in fact rejected severely and hunted down or sought to hunt down this this newly born king, the piety, and the polity. And yet we also know that they were those who received this, this king born in a manger. They were the least of these. And we know also that 33 years later he was rejected by the Jewish nation and he was crucified on a cross that we just spoke about as we observed the Lord's table However, what the unbelieving Jews meant for evil, God, we know, sovereignly predetermined for our good, for our salvation. We read in Acts chapter 2, verses 23 through 24, familiar verse, this man delivered over by the predetermined plan, that is Jesus, delivered over by the predetermined plan and foreknowledge of God, you Nailed, speaking to the Jewish nation, you nailed to the cross by the hands of a godless man and put him to death. But God raised him up again, putting an end to the agony of death since it was impossible for him to be held in its power. Jesus made clear that this was the reason he came. In fact, clear even to the end. I love the, the picture and the reflection of, of the... Uh, of that moment that Jesus is with Zacchaeus on the way up to, to Jerusalem on the last, his last journey into Jerusalem when he would be crucified. And he, I remember Zacchaeus come, come down from that tree. Zacchaeus was a tax collector. They didn't like tax collectors. Some things never change. But Zacchaeus was saved that day. And Jesus made clear that he was, that it was this reason that he had come. For I've come, he says, to seek and save that which was lost. 
And 40 days after Jesus' crucifixion and then resurrection, he ascended into heaven. And on that day, two truths, two truths were declared. The first was the command of Jesus himself. And remember that command. It's a command to us. It's a great commission. Go therefore and make disciples and baptize them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. And we see that he articulates it and says we're not alone in this. In Acts chapter 1 verse 8, he says the Holy Spirit will come upon you, he says. Reminding the disciples that he's with them. And you shall be my witnesses in Jerusalem and Samaria and in Judea and Samaria and even to the remotest parts of the earth, he says to them. The second truth is given by God's messengers. You might remember that we've mentioned it in previous sermons. Verses 9 through 11, they were standing there looking up as Jesus ascended. And God's messengers, angels, spoke to those who were there, the apostles and all that were there watching. It says that, says that, verse 9, after he had said these things, he was lifted up. And while they were looking on, and, and a cloud received him out of their sight. And as they were gazing intently into the sky, while he was going, behold, two men in white clothing stood beside him. And they also said, men of Galilee, why do you stand looking into the sky? This Jesus, he says, who has been taken up from you into heaven will come in just the same way as you have watched him go into heaven. He will come in the same way. This was the message. Preach the gospel till I come, and I am coming. And until I come, just as we observe the Lord's table, until I come, until he comes. And this is what we see throughout the scriptures. The apostles did so. They preached the gospel and anticipated the Lord's return. We observe it throughout Acts in our study thus far. In our Acts, so we made it up to chapter 16 and 17. The church was established. Apostles preached the gospel. They, beginning in Jerusalem and Samaria and the remotest parts of the earth, remember Paul had the Macedonia call, where he took Silas and Timothy with him. And there he planted churches. He planted churches in Philippi, in Thessalonica, and in Berea, and then in Corinth, where at which he wrote this letter to, to the Thessalonians shortly after. Considered the first letter epistle of Paul, in, as, as well as Galatia, the church or, or Galatians. But he wrote this letter, remember, he, as he received report, sent Timothy back, concerned for the Thessalonians because of the persecution they were going, un, going through, finding out how the church was faring, and we understood, as we've learned so far, that they fared quite well. But they were faithful. And so we observed in doing so that they were spreading the gospel. We read here that as we study in 1 Thessalonians, that, that not only were they preaching the gospel, but they were anticipating the Lord's return. We see it over and over again here in, in our study. First, in chapter 1, Paul prays the Thessalonians for the sounding forth the, the gospel both in Macedonia and Achaia. Can you imagine this small little church immediately covering that much area with the gospel? Their testimony was, was already being passed out into the other parts of the region because they were a city of much commerce. Everyone traveled through Thessalonica, and so their testimony was being spread. So Paul praises them, and then he says, after verse 8, he then we read of the hope of his coming. He praises them for sharing the gospel. Then he tells them this. I read this last week. And to wait for his son from heaven, whom he raised from the dead. That is, Jesus who rescues us from the wrath to come. In chapter 2, Paul shared of the sufferings. He, Timothy, and Silas suffered for the sake of the gospel. Then he praised them for becoming imitators as well, suffering together. And then... Paul says, you are a crown. You are a joy. When? At the presence of the Lord at his coming. In chapter 3, having praised them for their steadfast faith and love, then he praises them again. And he prays for them. 
And remember what he prayed? He prayed this. He prayed, may the Lord cause you to increase and abound in love for one another and for all people, just as also you, you do, uh, also do for you, so that he may establish your hearts without blame and holiness before our God and Father at the coming of our Lord Jesus with all the saints. So it is that we see here this emphasis, the gospel, living in the view of the, uh, the uh, parousia, the, 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 the Lord's coming, and in the text we see the emphasis as well on the gospel, the gospel and the Lord's coming. And so as we come here to chapter 4, verses 13 through 18, Paul now gives clarification, he expands on this, on what he means by the coming of the Lord, the, in the Greek, the parousia, the coming. He, he, he does so by clarifying some of the confusion. He brings it up because there's confusion in the church of Thessalonica of this promise. Now as we look at this and begin to look at what it means, the Lord's coming, we, we need to stop and take a moment and, and explain some things of what it's not because there's some confusion in, around the Lord's coming around his return. What does he mean by it? What event is this exactly? And so we need to first clarify what Paul is not referring to, what he's not saying, what, what, what event he is not referring to. And so let me say this. Paul is not referring to what we know as the second coming or the second advent of Christ, which refers to the time in which Christ will physically come to earth, just as he did in his first advent. When he comes again, he will physically set his feet upon the Mount of Olives. We read in Zechariah chapter 14, verse 4. Following that, he will set up his earthly kingdom, which we read in Revelation chapter 20, verses 1 through 7. A thousand year reign. We see the substance of this in Isaiah, particularly Isaiah 11. uh, And other parts of Isaiah. Isaiah speaks of this time, of this kingdom, uh, uh, this uh, time of established kingdom on earth and we'll look further next week and talk a little bit more about it why this is important and why how this relates to israel how this relates to to christ's coming uh, if we have time there's so much prophecy and so little so little uh time to talk about it but what paul describes here then in first thessalonians chapter 4 verses 13 through 18 is not the second coming of second advent But what Paul describes here is what we'll see is called the rapture. We've used this term before, the rapture of the church. And those who are older may be very familiar with this and much of the information here because you probably read a series of books called what? What is it? I don't think we're thinking of the same book. I don't know. I think you guys are Left Behind. Does that sound familiar? Is that what you were thinking of? Just say yes. That's what I was thinking of, even if you weren't. Yes, I was thinking of that. Left Behind series, right, by, by uh, Jerry Jenkins and, and uh, Tim LaHaye. It's a movie, yes. For those who can't read, there's a movie. <laughs> right. Not saying that that's Julie, but I'm just saying, right. right. And, and the title is in reference to the, the unbelieving world being left behind after the rapture. Uh, the term rapture comes from... Uh, the Latin word raptura, which was originally the translation in the Latin uh, Bible of to be caught up, uh, or podzo, and for those who are working on their Greek, has the meaning of to suddenly be removed or snatched away. And that's the understanding we do have of the rapture. And it's, that is given here, as we'll see in our passage here. The word is used 14 times in, in the New Testament. And even Paul's uh, experience of being caught up in, in a vision into heaven is used the same word, to be caught up into heaven in 2 Corinthians chapter 12. But the rapture, according to our understanding of Scripture, happens as far as its order, which is important, happens prior to what is called the time of tribulation. Jesus gives it this word, tribulation, in Matthew chapter 24. He mentions it three times. He mentions uh, the tribulation the, and the great tribulation in chapter 24. Chapter 24 of Matthew really is a summation of the, of the tribulation period as well as the book of Revelation. 
We also know from the Old Testament, as it's mentioned, as a time of Jacob's trouble or distress. We'll look at here in a moment. It's also reflected to this time of a period of seven years. Daniel talks about it and articulates it, and we talk about it in the 70th week of Daniel. In Daniel chapter 9, verses 24 through 27, it's very specific about the events that will come on and reflect also in that correlate with, with Matthew 24 and also correlate with, with Revelation as well and those times with the Antichrist and what will take place. Uh, God is very specific with numbers, speaking about three and a half years uh, or seven years divided in half, three and a half years and three and a half years and the latter half or the, or the prior half is also mentioned in Scripture, Revelation 11, 3, Revelation 12, 3, we heard as 1,260 days, also referenced as 42 months. Now, uh, in the uh, Jewish calendar, it's 360 days in a year, not 365, which will help you if you're counting. This is also called part of what's the day of the Lord. The day of the Lord is when God intervenes directly into his creation. Mostly referred to in a negative sense in, in Scripture. In fact, we'll read and talk about it in chapter 5 as Paul talks about the day of the Lord in chapter 5. You're in, your, in your Bibles, you'll see that as the title of some of your Bibles there as the heading there of chapter 5 at the beginning. This time will be designated as, as, as a time for refining and the redemption of Israel in which God will bring about the salvation of Israel as a nation, as an elect nation, fulfilling his covenant promises, and we'll talk about that, Lord willing, too. So much to talk about, again, so little time, so much good stuff. But this time will be not something that, <laughs> that is, uh, will be joyful. It's a time rightly named as tribulation. In fact, Jeremiah defines it just really briefly. Turn over to Jeremiah chapter 30 verses 5 through 7 here referring to the time of of Jacob's trouble Jacob's distress Jeremiah major prophet Jeremiah 30 And notice what he says here, Jeremiah 30, verses 5 through 7. For thus says the Lord, I have heard a sound of terror, a dread, and there is no peace. Ask now and see if a male can give birth. All right, is, can a male give birth? Absolutely not. Scriptures say it. Science tells it. I know there's some confusion today, but we read it right here. A male cannot give birth. But he says, why do you see every man with his hands on his loins as a woman in childbirth? And why have all faces turned pale? And then he says, alas, for that day is great. Referring to a future day. That day is great. There is none like it. And it is a time of Jacob's distress, that Jacob's troubles, reference to that time of tribulation. And yet you notice here that God speaks of, of a remnant, a, a, a redemption. Notice what he says here as he ends, but it, he will be saved. That is, Jacob, Israel, will be saved from it. There will be those who are saved through it. Israel's redemption, the Lord describes the turning of Israel Israel to Christ. In fact, the prophet uh, Zechariah speaks of it. We know that at the end of the tribulation, Jesus will return physically to earth. His second advent, he will bring judgment. In fact, we read in Revelation chapter 19, it says, from his mouth comes a sharp sword, and with it he may strike down the nations. But we read in Zechariah chapter 12, verse 10, it says this, I will pour out on the house of David at this time. I will pour out on the house of David and on the inhabitants of Jerusalem the spirit of grace 
his Holy Spirit, and of supplication, so that they will look on me, whom they have pierced. Who, who is it talking about? Who was pierced? Jesus. Who was pierced? And they will mourn for him as one mourns for an only son. And they will weep bitterly over him like, bitter, like the bitter weeping for a firstborn. Israel will turn to Christ. There will be a remnant. There will be uh, a, a Israel as a nation saved as God promised. And in so, just looking forward, this is where God fulfills his promises of the Abrahamic covenant. Now, I don't have time to go through the Abrahamic covenant, but you know it was in, in, in chapter 12 of Genesis. God told Abraham, what? Go to a place I will what? Show you, and I'll make you a great nation. And I will bless those who? And I'll curse those who? And God promised him three things, land, seed, and blessing. And we know that that seed's carried out through the Scripture, land in Deuteronomy chapter Thirty in the first chapter it speaks of that covenant, that land come, that promise is repeated in First uh, First Chronicles chapter sixteen, verse fifteen and following. We have the Davidic covenant, meaning of the seed, that the promise of Christ throughout the Old Testament. We see it very clearly in First Samuel chapter twelve, twelve or uh, fourteen, I believe, and or twelve and seven, brothers, seven, twelve through fourteen. And then we also see the new covenant that we talked about this morning, Jeremiah chapter 31. This will be fulfilled. This is a literal unconditional promise that is to, to Israel. And these promises will be fulfilled. It's interesting right now that what's happening in Jerusalem, God talks about a regathering of Israel. Guess what's happening in Jerusalem right now? If you watch the news and get to YouTube, there are Jews f who are, are, are overwhelming Jerusalem. They're coming back coming back to their homelands. In fact, in fact, Israel has a special program for the Jews to come back and to repatriate them into the, into the country. Why? Because God said it would happen. Because God's promise. But they must go through trial before they see and come as a nation. For they rejected him when he came but they will look upon whom him whom they have pierced and so this period will last a period of seven years but the tribulation period will come and follow follow will become christ's coming and when they will see him and so the rapture would take place before this hence the title of the book left behind That the, that the rapture will come after the tribulation is, is clearly indicated in, in, in our study of 1 Thessalonians. In fact, there are many indications here of the order of this and that the tribulation will come afterwards. Let me share a, a few with them. In fact, we, we already read one of, the, one of the, the indications in Scripture in chapter 1, verse 10. 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 10. It says here, that we are waiting for the Son from heaven, whom, raised from the, who, whom he raised from the dead, that is Jesus, who rescues us from the wrath to come. What is the wrath to come? The wrath to come is the tribulation, the time of tribulation. That is to come. We see it repeated also. Just put, put a note in your notes. I already probably did for you there. If you have the notes, First Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 9. Again, saved from the wrath to come. We also see another, another indication here uh, in in our, our, this book, chapter 5. It's the second clue here. Paul's word uses in chapter 5 and how he uses the personal pronouns. In chapter 4, he's talking about the rapture. He talks about we, we, we will be caught up. We will be with the Lord. And then you turn to chapter 5 and you'll notice in the first three verses that he turns from the first person plural to the third person plural. And notice what he says. While they were saying peace, peace, and safety. It's an important word in our day, right? We want to bring peace in the Middle East. Peace, peace. They were saying peace, peace, and safety. Then destruction will come upon them. And suddenly, like labor pains upon a woman with child, they will not escape. 
Paul doesn't include himself with this. He doesn't expect himself to be part of the tri- this tribulation period, this time of Jacob's trouble, nor will any one of those who are redeemed. And this is, this is what we see in Scripture. Now, a third indication is in the context. For we know that the Thessalonians were, were concerned about those saints who had died and, and missed the rapture. What about those who were, what about those in the rapture? What about those who won't be here when Christ returns? What will be of them? What will be of the reward? What will be of what, what you've taught us about them? What will happen? If they believed they were going through the tribulation, do you think they'd want anybody to be upset that, 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 the, that some had died and gone to be with the Lord? Probably not. In fact, some of us are just ready to go now because of the way the world is. The same would be in this situation. Now, to keep these events in order, I need to bring out the, our old timeline. Some of us are new for some of you, but I just want to give it to you so you have a picture of this order and the things to come. It'll be helpful to us uh, as we look at this in this short time. And we won't spend much time, but we're going to be looking at this. So just put in your mind. Always have this in your mind. This is helpful to kind of gather our thoughts. We see Christ came, and this is based off Daniel chapter 9, verses 24 to 27. Very, very specific. We have the Messiah cut off, which we read in Daniel chapter 9, the, 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 and at this, this time. Christ is cut off. We're in a present church age, or dispensation, as we would call it. And the next thing that is imminent to come is the rapture. Christ taking the church up to meet him in the airs. So it's not a second coming where he comes literally on earth, but he, we're caught up in the air, raptura, to be caught up. And then comes the tribulation, seven-year period of tribulation. And then Christ's second coming. He's coming literally to earth. He'll set up his millennial kingdom. Read that in Revelation 20, 1 to 10. And then after that, obviously, we have the great white throne judgment, and we have the, the new heaven and new earth, new heavens, meaning the atmosphere, new world where the Lord will establish us forever. As the second Adam, Christ, will do what the first Adam didn't do. And so this is the picture we have of this. Now all of this said, it brings us now finally to our text of study. And as we observed and studied, Paul had taught them concerning these things. Can you imagine? Paul was there probably at, at a minimum three weeks. And he's teaching the whole counsel of God's word. He's teaching about the sovereignty of God and salvation. Teaching them of all these things. Teaching about eschatology. This is a young church. These are many of most, mostly Greek. And he's teaching in these truths because it's their hope. And he repeats it over and over again as, we read in, as we've read in 1 Thessalonians. And as we know from our previous study time together in verses 9 through 13, the Thessalonians were zealous for Christ's coming. And some were overzealous for Christ's coming. Some not continuing in the work. In fact, some of them were like many today who are decided, well, I don't need to get a job after COVID. And living off the goodness of others who are working. Because that's what we do. And it was no different in those days. They were some who decided not to get jobs or or, or re-up or or even quit their jobs because they believed that Christ would, would come very shortly, immediately. And certainly that's the way we should live, that Christ could come at any time, and he could because his coming is to be imminent. But we are are not in the same time uh, uh, frame as Christ is in in the thinking of time. But Jesus could come at any time. And as observed, Paul told them, this is how you're to live. He exhorted them, remember, in our last study, he exhorted them that they are to, to, for the brethren to to excel still more in love. Love the brethren increasingly. Keep on keeping on, loving the brethren, being faithful, and practicing all the attributes of love. 
as well as all, the, as well as all the other fruits of the Spirit. Act sensibly. Live unintrusively. Mind your own business. Don't be a busybody. Keep to your work, which he says in verse 4, verse 11 through 12. Work heartily. Faithful to tend to your work until Christ come. And it's interesting that, you know, we have the same uh, instruction from Paul to the Corinthians in 1 Corinthians chapter 15. And Paul talks about what will happen at the rapture there, what will happen to our body. Then he closes in verse 58, one of our favorite verses, of mine anyway. He says, Therefore, my beloved brethren, be steadfast and movable, always abound in the work of the Lord, knowing that your toil is not in vain. It's our character as we, we work and we look for the Lord's coming. So then, having exhorted them in their behavior, Paul now addresses some concern, some confusion about the coming of Christ. Again, as we noted, about those who had died before Christ's coming. In fact, later, they'll be even more confused because of the increased persecutions we'll see. But, but in verse 13, we see here uh, through 18, I want to give you this outline as we look at this, this this Sunday and next Sunday, that he, we see, first of all, that, that Paul comforts them. We see that he gives correction to their confusion briefly, and then he clarifies these events, what is actually going to happen, what's to come, what we can expect, and he's very detailed in it. And so let's begin here with the short time we have here as we set those things up and got the bigger picture. Let's look and narrow down and, and drill down on what the Apostle Paul is saying here to them. And it's important for us because as we come and think about hope, this is absolutely important in the context. Notice he says, but do not, I do not want you to be uninformed, brethren, about those who are asleep, that you may not grieve as, those, as the rest who, who have no hope. And this is such an important passage we begin here. Immediately recognize the concern. Again, the concern being for loved ones gone on to be with the Lord in the midst of the Lord's coming. This is what is meant here by falling asleep. It's not what, you know, it's not a Sunday, regular Sunday morning where you fall asleep. Some, some of you look a little dead this morning, but, it's, but this is what it means. It, means. it means to be dead. But I like this terminology, to sleep. It means to slumber, to sleep, or, or here in a euphemistic expression, it means to be dead, to, to have died. But, but the, the reason this word is used, I believe, in Scripture and indicated that, that this designation, falling asleep, is intended to describe the body as it's in, in its state apart from the soul. It's, it's, it's dead. It's, it's apart from the soul. It's dead. It's lying in state, ready and waiting for the resurrection. This word is used throughout Scripture. It's used of those saints. Remember when Jesus breathed his last breath on the cross, he gave up his and he gave up his spirit. And what happened? Dead were raised. Dead were raised. It's used to the dead that were raised. Those who, were, who, were, who had fallen asleep were raised. It's used of Jesus in the tomb. It's used of Stephen's martyrdom when he was stoned to death. There was no sleeping involved there. It was dead. And so we see here the concern may have also been even deeper for them because here they're in the midst of this, and we'll see later in 2 Thessalonians that they are worried so much, so much persecution, that they even think that, that they missed the rapture and, and that they were in the, already in the tribulation. And Paul assures them they didn't because something has to come first, which is ultimately the tribulation, as we'll see. Another indication of what we would call a, a pre tribulational rapture, pre-trib. You heard those words. We'll talk about more later. Many, again, have died of natural causes, but many have died because of martyrdom. Paul made clear in chapter 1 and chapter 2, they, they, they received the word under much tribulation. In fact, he says, you became inter, a, 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 an example or imitators of us and suffering by your own countrymen were, were putting you to death. And, 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 and so bad was the persecution Again, that they thought they'd missed the rapture and, and were in the tribulation, as we see in Second Thessalonians. But, but, but when we think about this, I mean, when we put ourselves in the context of this passage, we have no idea what the Thessalonians in our, in our day and age were going through to receive the word. In fact, they, they were struggling certainly more than we do with all our first world problems. Don't you have a lot of first world problems? Did you have a lot of problems this week? They're first world problems. 
You might ask yourself this morning, what do I have to do to go through to receive the word? You simply to hear and believe by God's grace. Then getting up in the morning and go to church, participating in the joy of fellowship and service without fear, sharing the gospel without the thought of arrest or death. We are blessed. We receive the word without tribulation here, which may be the reason that our nation is post-Christian. The Thessalonians were being persecuted and, and some even suffering death. And so the concern, what are the saints who trusted in Christ and were martyred for their faith and have died before his coming? And this is what Paul says. He tells them, I don't want you to be uninformed, brethren, about those who are asleep. He doesn't want them to, to be ignorant of the word of God and what the truth says that you may not grieve as those, the rest of those who have no hope. The salient point, as the rest who don't have hope. And he's making a contrast here, and it's important for us to see this, even, even, as we, even for you here this morning, if you're not a believer. This is not to say the world doesn't have hope. The world has lots of hope. They even call this the season of hope. However, a worldly understanding of hope is, is different than, than a believer's understanding of hope because a, a worldly understanding of hope or the world's understanding of hope has no certainty. It's just a hope. I hope that happened. I really hope that we do this. There's no certainty. And to be fair, we live with the same definition in the context of hope in general things, but it's not with eternal things. We're, we're not those who are without hope, who have no hope. Because in this, we are not uninformed. We are not ignorant. But it's not so for the unbeliever in, in, in Christ. And I have not seen this so evident than in a, in a book uh, written by Dan DeWitt, who, who wrote a book called Jesus or Nothing, in which he shares the confession of an atheist quoting, uh, and quoting from the book God, Good Without God. It's written by a, a man by Greg Epstein, who is a a secular humanist chaplain at Harvard University who criticizes, actually, Richard Dawkins. Richard Dawkins is the most famous atheist in the world. He criticized Dawkins for having nothing of value to say to a student struggling with nihilism, which is a rejection of all religion and ultimately believing that, that, that life is meaningless. So he chastises or he, he, he complains or criticizes Dawkins about how he responds to this man. For this man believes nihilism is, a, is the logical conclusion to atheism, which it is. And the student admits that he is, he is contemplating suicide and asks Dawkins for advice. And Dawkins gives him this advice. He encourages the young man to write his experience on the Dawkins website and seek from a broader atheist community. And Dan DeWitt writes this. He says, I found the following conversion on Dawkins, or conversation rather, on Dawkins' blog shortly after I read Epstein's book. And I can't help but think the person in the book and the blog are one and the same. Here is an excerpt from the original post. He says this. In the past few months, this is presumably this young man, in the past few months, I've been having, from what I understand the term mean, nihilistic thoughts when pondering what I call the big question. And he says, in quotes, usually after a toke or two, so it's very relevant, sounds like just today. I know that Richard and others have said before that you give life your own meaning and that we create our own purpose in life. But aren't we just really blank ourselves? I mean... In a few hundred years, we will all be dead and no one will remember our names or actions. Maybe Richard. But you get my point, he says. After that, in millions of years, <laughs> the human race will be gone and what will all this have meant? What end goal are we striving towards? Is existence really the only reason to persist in life? 
I'm just having trouble caring about what seems to be trivial activities in my daily life now. Why should I care that, I, that, that, that what laws, uh, care what laws my government is passing any more than I care about the laws that the Syrians were subjected to? What does it matter? All these questions, he says, I'm sorry to dump uh, so much out in a single post, but as I was lying in bed coming to terms with the fact that my life and the entire universe, for that matter, pretty much exists without meaning, I had what I suppose was a panic attack. It was a terrifying experience. Anyone else experienced this? And here was the reply posted by a fellow atheist giving hope. Now here's the hope of an atheist. Consider the following. Through science, we may be, which is obvious it was sick, meaning the original, able to find a cure for aging. It may even happen within your lifetime if you don't get yourself killed trying to make the most of it. Who says we can't have eternal life without spirituality? It's so encouraging. Is this really the hope for humanity, to find a cure for dying? Eternal life without spirituality? Paul reminds us in Ephesians 2, verse 12, that this was the circumstance in which we all once were in. He says, remember that you were at the time separate from Christ, excluded from the commonwealth of Israel, strangers to the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in this world. This is evident here. In fact, he responds, this young man responds to this, this comment of eternal life without religion. He says this, this is, that is, which I, I am having trouble coming to grips with. This, this, this is what you call eternal life without religion. I'm just a chemical reaction that the physical laws of the universe are trying to continue. I'm meaningless. Is that true? Absolutely not. God created us. We were created in the image of God. It's evident. Romans chapter 1 verse 19 says he's made it evident in you. He's made it evident in you. Ecclesiastes chapter 3 verse 11 tells us that, that God has made everything appropriate in his time. He also set eternity in our hearts. He's made it evident in the creation, Paul says as well in chapter 1 of Romans. Reading the scripture, Psalm 19.1, the heavens are telling the glory of God and their expanse is declaring the work of his hands. We're not without excuse. In the depravity of man, he continually suppresses the truth and unrighteousness, God says. Continually. Because to believe in a God means I have to believe in accountability and morality, truth. But I can't do that, the atheist would say. And even to the question of the creation of life and that, that there is order, that they would sum it down and say, well, maybe aliens. Because aliens are easy, they don't hold you accountable, apparently. But there are no aliens. There is a God whom they are alienated from because of their sins. Man is not without hope. But those who reject Christ are those who have no hope. For hope is in Christ alone. And, and notice this is what Paul makes clear. Even in, in the future, even the future for those who have died, he brings it back to the gospel. And notice what he says here in verse 14. He says, For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so God will bring with him those who have fallen asleep. This is the gospel. Jesus came, God incarnate, God in human flesh. He died, was buried, and he rose again for the forgiveness of sin, just as we we shared at the beginning the hope that we have. This is the certain hope. Christ, this is the, Christ is our hope. This is repeating the scripture we noted earlier in 1 Timothy. Paul says, Jesus Christ, who is our hope. 
We read in Scripture that this hope comes by grace. He told later, Thessalonians reminds him, Now may the Lord Christ himself, our God, and God our Father, who has loved us and given us eternal comfort and good hope by grace. We read as well that this, this hope is what sustains us every day. And this is important. Some of you are easily depressed, easily discouraged. You look at the news and you look at what's going on in the news, you are overwhelmed. But you are not like those without hope. You are not like the world. God has given you, he tells, I do not want you to be uninformed, brethren. I don't want you to be ignorant as those who are without hope. For Christ is your hope. Even through our difficult times, Paul here writes to the Corinthians, indeed, we had the sentence of death within ourselves so that we would not trust in ourselves, but in God who raises the dead, who delivered us from so great a peril of death, and will deliver us, he on whom we have set our hope. And he will yet deliver us. What is your hope this morning? What is it, hope? It is this hope in which Paul assures the Thessalonians concerning those who had died, telling them, if you believe, he says, Jesus died and rose again, even so God will bring with him those who have fallen asleep. Paul assures them that those who have fallen and have died in Christ will be with him at his coming, at the rapture. He will bring them with them. Paul alluded to this earlier in 1 Thessalonians chapter 3, verse 13. He prayed, May he, may God, may establish your hearts without blame and holiness before our God. And Father, verse 13, in, in that verse 13, at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and all the saints. At his coming with all the saints with all those who have passed. That means all those whom you know who have believed your loved ones, they will, with the rapture to come today, they would be coming with Christ. And we'll see what happens in verses 13 to 14, which you, or 14, or 15 through 18, which you know, but many of you know, but it is so good to go through it and to be affirmed by it. But until then, I, I we'll discuss that next week, but until then, I want you to, to leave you with this focus of hope as we begin this season of hope. And the importance that we are called to be those who are to declare the hope. Remember Jesus' great commission, two things, over, over arching truths in Acts. Go and preach the gospel. He is coming. He is coming. We are not without hope in this world. And so as we see the truth of God's word being suppressed and man and the, and, and, and the man of God, the man and woman of God being suppressed and even persecuted, and the man is doing what is right in his own mind, we need to be reminded that we are not like those who are without hope in the world. Our hope is certain because it is in Christ, just as certain as he came, lived a perfect life, died for our sins on the cross, and rose again, so the certainty is that he's going to come again. Jesus promised this to his disciples. He just, he, he, even before his death, he promised it to them. You might remember how he comforted disciples in John 14, 1 through 3. Do not let your heart be troubled. Believe in God. Believe also in me. Important fact, just as Paul said this to the Thessalonians, the, if you believe, then he says this. Believe also in me, in my Father's house are many dwelling places. If, I were, if it were not so, I would have told you, for I go to prepare a place for you, and if I go to prepare a place for you, I will what? I will come again and receive you to myself, that where I am, there you will be also. That's the promise and the hope of the believer. The, the unbeliever has no hope. If you've never received Christ, you're without hope this morning. This is what the scripture says of, to you. Notice these passages. 
Proverbs says this of the, of the one who is wicked. When a wicked man dies, his hope perishes. All he expected from his power comes to nothing. Nothing. Verse 23, the desire of the righteous ends only in good, but the hope of the wicked only in wrath. Proverbs 24, verse 20, for the evil man has no future hope, and the lamp of the wicked will be snuffed out. My friend, if you've never trusted Christ, and if you're here this morning, young person or older person, you've never trusted Christ, you have no hope. You're like that, that atheist. You may believe in God, but never bowed your knee to God. And God says, no one good will be in heaven. And you can hope that I'm good enough. And that's what you hear all the time. I hope that I'm good enough. I hope I've done all these things. I hope. That's not a hope that is certain. Because you have not believed in Christ. And only Christ is sufficient. Only his work is sufficient. Only his work merits And justifies. And so it is young person, old person, older person. You ask yourself, where is your hope? Which represents you this morning? Well, I'm here to tell you I have hope. I love the words of the writer of Hebrews. He says this. The hope we have is an anchor of the soul, a hope both sure and steadfast and one which enters within the veil, the one that takes us within the holy of holies. This week, don't be discouraged. This, this days ahead, young people, don't be overwhelmed by what's going on in the world because that is not your hope. Did you read what Solomon said? He says, when the wicked man dies, his hope perishes, and all he, ex all he expected from his power, this world comes to nothing. Comes to nothing. So don't be ignorant, my brothers and sisters. Know the truth. Lies lead to hopelessness. Truth sets us free. Unbeliever, you do not need to walk in uncertainty. Know the truth. The truth also sets you free. Jesus says, I am the way and the life and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father but through me. And so will you believe on Christ today? Jesus speaks us through, through, through the scriptures, 1 John 5, 11. He who has the Son has life. He who does not have the Son of God does not have life. I write these things to you that you may know that you have eternal life. That's the certainty we have. And so this is our instruction as we come in to this, that we are not like those without hope. Paul says, I don't want you to be like those without hope. Don't be ignorant, but rejoiceful. Father, thank you so much this morning for the hope that we have. And as we look at, Lord, the world imploding on itself, that this is a season of hope because we are not like those without hope. And we're those who, Father, continue to look for your coming. And Lord, it could be soon. We anticipate, we're excited. But, Lord, until then, we are to be faithful. We are to be faithful to be those who, whose love continues to excel still more. We are to be those who, whose heart is to be faithful to the work that you've called us to, not to be busybodies, but to be busy about your work, to be faithful until you come. As you tell us in Titus that we are to be those who, who, who are not caught up in the things of the world, that we are not to busy ourselves with those things that detract from you. But we are to be those who are faithful and those who are looking for the blessed hope. And so I pray, Father, for your church and even for the one who, who may not still have bowed the knee to you. Lord, I pray, Father, that they would seek your hope and that, that it is theirs through Christ, by grace, through faith, and for them to bow the knee this morning to repent of the sin and to turn to you. And so I pray, Father, for the church in this season that we would, Lord, reflect the joy of the hope that we have in you and make sure that we say Merry Christmas.
and that we take the opportunity to cultivate conversations when we have them and to plant the seed of the gospel for we have the message of eternal life. We pray this and thank you, Lord, in Jesus' name, the one who is our hope. Amen. Amen. Let's stand together as we close this morning, as we sing together all to us. Christ is our precious cornerstone in which we stand. He's the anchor of our hope. Let's sing together. Thank you.